If you're taking surveys, for example, you see a stem, an item stem, and it gives you something to read and think about, and then it gives you a response scale. Right? So everybody's reading it with whatever levels of English that they feel like they've mastered. Everybody interprets words a little bit differently, even if they're all speaking the same language. So introspectively, you are subjectively interpreting it, but then we get it reported on a standardized scale. So that everybody's subjective interpretation comes back to us in a relatively unbiased scale that we can compare amongst people in a valid and reliable way. So introspection is still with us. Now, I'll point out this last thing because I think it's interesting, but you'll notice it's not indented. So it's guaranteed not to be on your tests. It's an interesting fact that Voot had so many students. It was really amazing how productive this guy was and how many people flocked to his laboratory to learn under his tutelage, to understand what he was doing, to start a new science. And then those people, having learned that information and those skills and techniques, would then fan out the world over and start starting their own labs and spreading that knowledge and getting new knowledge. And so he started up a movement that continues today, unabated and grown to proportions he could probably not begin to imagine back in 1879. So that's how we get started with Wilhelm Wundt. You can see that you better know what structuralism is for your test. If you're philosophically minded and just interested, it starts sparking some ideas about what consciousness is and how you experience the world yourself. But then you go, well, Wilhelm Wundt, he got an asterisk beside him, so he might be a bonus item on my test. The introspection is a technique that he used, and I should know what that means. But at the very bottom, hey, that's an interesting point of fact that really does relate to how we get here today in this very room, right? If not for this person, probably somebody else would have done it, but we trace our roots back right here. In fact, I can trace my own professional lineage all the way back to this guy right here. Right, the person who trained under him, who trained somebody else, who trained somebody else, who trained somebody else, who trained Scott Geller, who trained me. Right, and so we see it goes all the way back. So fascinating and relevant to some degree, but it will not be on your test. The functionalism is a school that you want to be able to contrast with structuralism. And looking right there, just that one word, it ought to tell you something fundamentally different. Ism's still there, so it's still a school of thought. <coughs> But it's functionalism instead of structuralism. And when we look at functionalism, we see that they're interested in consciousness too. The functionalists also want to know all about this human experience. Individuals and group experiences. How we function with consciousness though is their idea of focus. It doesn't really matter for them what it's made up of. If you can even find little units and subunits of consciousness, what does that really tell us? From their point of view, it's not something you discard, but it's not the most important factor of human consciousness. What's the most important factor of human consciousness? And keep in mind that Darwin was all the rage back then, was adapting to circumstances, right? The species which adapt are the species which survive. What species is dominant on Earth? human beings. So they have this unique human consciousness that allows them to adapt to unbelievable circumstances at times. So it's the function of consciousness to allow you to adapt and survive. From a species point of view, it's what makes us particularly, particularly adaptive. Right? Because all species adapt or they die off. But we seem to be able to adapt to unbelievably different circumstances and keep on keeping on. William James, got him an asterisk. Brother Henry James, a novelist. You may have read some of Henry James. I find him hard to read. I had to read some when I was an undergraduate. Turn to the screw. Had to have a dictionary beside me to understand what the man was saying every paragraph. It's a little too thick for me. I didn't quite enjoy it, but he was famous. The Jameses were famous. They were rich, rich white dudes. Which means what? They had leisure time to indulge in the pursuit of knowledge, right? Other people are making a living trying not to die, right? They had the privilege of being able to indulge academic interests. So it's not that they were 
all that in and of themselves. They had circumstances that allowed them to emerge as all that. And in fact, they were geniuses. They did demonstrate that they were very exceptional people. So he led the school of thought called functionalism. He's formally trained as a physician. You'll find a lot of your early psychologists are physicians. And that's really early in medical science as well. And the physicians that wind up in psychology are the ones that think the human experience, the psychological aspects of it, the mental health aspects of it, are the most interesting facets of human existence. And so they wind up in psychology oftentimes to understand where things go wrong with people. Not always. But William James is just as famous almost as Wilhelm Wundt because he was our first American psychologist. He published Principles of Psychology in 1890 and one of the most influential texts it became. Interestingly enough, the man was plagued with chronic depression and somatic concerns. He always had these non-specific physical complaints that didn't seem to have any real physical causes, but that's hard to determine, especially back then. And with some of the travels, they might have contracted some, some other kinds of rare you know, microbes that infected them, but he seemed to have problems somatically that were probably psychological in nature. And he was depressed a lot. And he wrote this gigantic book on psychology, and when he was done with it, he didn't even like it. He thought it was less than his best by a long shot. But it was the best. It was the best that existed at the time. And it became the leading psychology textbook for decades. So for decades, most people's introduction to psychology was reading Wilhelm, not Wilhelm, excuse me, William, because he's American, no W there being a V, William James's Principles of Psychology. That turns out to be, if you ever read it today, and it's available online for free, a very prescient book. In other words, he's making suggestions and guesses based on the rudimentary knowledge of the day that was research based on all kinds of aspects of the human experience and on many occasions he turns out to be right. In other words, it's just theorizing at that point. There's not a lot of data to support it. In fact, he wasn't really that much of a researcher. He had a research lab, but he left it to other people to do the research. He's researching. He's also a very well-known philosopher. His main contribution to philosophy is a, a type of philosophy called pragmatism, where you look at truth with a little t in terms of its practical applicability to life. If it works, it's true for now until we find a better model, right? So his interest in our experience were philosophical and somewhat science-based and he took the information he had in the day and made some pretty remarkable guesses theorizing that was later backed up by actual actual science. So he was doing some, his students were doing a lot more, and he believed that consciousness was a continual flow of mental activity. If you've ever heard the term stream of consciousness, then you've heard of William James because that's his term. Stream of consciousness means your mind never stops. It always goes. It's always moving. It's in constant flux. If we want to go back to Heraclitus and a pre-Socratic philosophy, right? It's always moving. So trying to get the structure of something that never stops moving would be very difficult, wouldn't it? In fact, the fact that it's always moving may contribute to its adaptivity that allows us on a moment-to-moment -moment basis to reckon with our environment and make adjustments in our behavior so that we're able to, on the short term and long term, survive and reproduce and keep the species going. So this idea of this flux of mental activity gives you the notion that, wow, you really would have a hard time breaking it down into little discrete bits and little structural units that would make it up because it's constantly moving. If you're into meditation, one point of some types of meditation is to reach one-pointedness of mind or a state of no thought. I don't know that you can do that because how would you know that you weren't thinking unless you went, oh, I'm not thinking, and that's a thought. Right? You can't get away from it. Whether you're daydreaming or whether you're actively engaged, your mind is always doing some mental activity which we would call consciousness. So he thought you should study it as a whole. Functionally, what does it do? We want to see how it enables people to adapt to environments. It's essential function. So you can distinguish it if you know what you're talking about pretty quickly on the basis of the name. Structuralism versus functionalism. So sometimes our terms are actually pretty common sense and they make a lot of sense and sometimes they're a little bit more esoteric and a little more difficult to follow.